I've been getting a lot of questions about how the electric fan conversion that I did on my RV last winter has done. And I wanted to wait until I've gotten some miles on the thing and been able to test it in a number of different conditions, maybe not all of them, but at least enough to get a really good idea of how well the system performs and see if there's anything that I could or should have done differently. At this point, it's the end of, it's uh, mid-August in 2022. I've had this on the RV for about, oh, I guess I got it on in December of last year, and I've put about 10,000 miles on the system since installing it. Maybe not quite that much, but uh, right around there. The system is really performing well, and overall it's it's meeting or exceeding my expectations. I've now driven it in the summer with temperatures above 90 degrees, towing our Land Rover behind us, um, driven it in the mountains, although granted that was still during some colder months, and it, it's gotten a, a pretty good pretty good run to see how it does. The performance has been good, like I said, so in even the high temperatures of over 90 degrees, going down the highway, going through some hills, pulling the pulling our Land Rover behind, it's able to maintain uh, temperature. Now, what is that temperature and how does that how is that maybe different from how it was with the mechanical fan? So reality is it's not a whole lot different. And I'm seeing now typically somewhere around 200 to 204 degrees of coolant temperature. Something to remember with how this engine is designed is that it's got 190 degree thermostats. And so what that means is that they start opening at 190 and then they're fully open at 210. So one of the things that I've observed is that, or had observed before, and that carries over with the electric fans, is that there's a certain amount of cooling that is based off of airflow and the temperature difference between the ambient air and the coolant. But then there's also the component of coolant flow. So when you so you need to have a certain amount of coolant going through, and when you're in those first, especially first few degrees from 190 up to 195 or 200, the, the coolant flow is relatively low. So you have a lot of different things that are going and uh, going along and playing together to get the coolant temperature where it is. So it is a few degrees warmer than what I tended to have before with the mechanical fan, um, but overall it's it's still within an acceptable range. Caterpillar says the most efficient temperature to run this engine at is 210. So if anything, a little bit warmer isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, and in the and in the winter one of the benefits of it being now in that 195 to 200 range instead of before in the winter, it would actually be right at 190 or even a little bit below, is that there's more heat in the coolant, so that that means that it heats the interior better. And along with some of the other things that we've done to it, um, the, the heat is actually very good. Last winter, our first trip with the electric fans, we were driving down the road at night uh, around 13 degrees Fahrenheit, and we were still perfectly comfortable inside. Um, so a lot of benefits there. Uh, issues that I noted. So one thing, and I, I thought that this might be an issue when I made the original system and it turned out to be the, uh, the way that I set up the electric fans is that they are based only on coolant temperature. So something I didn't expect is that the natural convection of the air around the radiator at idle is enough to keep the engine cool enough that it actually doesn't need to use the fans at all. But when you stop after driving, the fans will run for a little bit until it gets down to about 195, which is the temperature where I have them starting to come on, and then they'll just shut off and you won't have any any fans. So what this means is that when you are then accelerating onto the highway, you have no coolant or no cooling flow through the intercooler or rather very little because you don't have a whole lot of natural airflow with a with a rear radiator rear intercooler setup likes on this rv so the way that i addressed that and also provided for a little bit of additional cooling is i added two pusher fans and i'll show you those in a minute to 
the intercooler and I right now I have them on a manual switch. I'm sitting in the driver's seat and I got a manual switch right down here that I can flip on and off. So you can see the little switch that I've got. This is for the fans on the intercooler and if I flip it, you can hear it just turns them on, turns them off, 100% manual and I can turn that on usually if I think I'm going to need want a little bit of extra power or if I'm seeing a longer uphill where I know I'm going to want a little bit of extra cooling um, to help keep the temperatures in check. The lighting's not very good here, but hopefully you can see this is the intercooler, or as they say in this vehicle world, uh, charge air cooler. And I just put those two pusher fans on, wired them up. Um, it would be more efficient to make a shroud, like what I did for the puller fans on the back. Um, but that might also restrict some airflow on the for, for the puller fans, and this was intended to just kind of be a little bit of a boost. So that's what I did, and they work pretty well just with that little toggle on off switch. Um, I may also set it up so that it can get turned on automatically based off of, it could be a number of different things. It could be uh, inter intercooler, Temperature or induction air temperature boost, uh, full throttle. I, I've, I've thought about some different ideas, but it does help. It does make a it does make a noticeable difference in uh, acceleration because I'm getting more airflow, um, and then what it also does is that it will help to keep the intercool the the intake air temperatures were getting up to over 200 degrees in fact the hottest i ever saw was was 250 which is the highest the sensor would do um on a diesel i'm really not super concerned about that uh, but it's still not what you want you still you still do want it to be colder um for reference on some of the gasoline on some of the spark ignition piston aircraft engines i used to run on run the intake air temperature limit was 400 degrees um and you still don't want it anywhere near that high, but point being that seeing seeing that high, the main main issue you're going to have on a diesel especially is going to be um, the higher temperature, meaning lower air density, uh, and therefore less power that you can make. So things that I would do differently, um, adding in these pusher fans at the start uh, probably would have been a good thing. Um, one problem that I've had is that the fan controllers that I used uh, in this project initially, which came off of a Mazda, they don't have, they have a weird failure mode, and I haven't played with this much yet or since putting on the pusher fans, but they have a failure mode where as the, as the cooling fans get hot, and those are the Dorman fans that I installed, they will demand more current for the same um, for for the same PWM percentage flow uh, percentage power, and so then what happens is when those fans get hot, they will trip the fan controller's current limit, and then they will shut off, and then it'll as they cool off, it'll it'll restart it. But I ran into this initially because it's temperature related, and I think that part of this had to do with the intercooler getting so hot. Uh, the intake air temperature getting so hot so the air ambient air was getting heated by the intercooler then further heated by the radiator and so by the time it got to the polar fans that i installed initially it was really very hot if i just sit there if i just sit with the engine off the fans will run indefinitely they never get hot it'll never trip an issue or never trip a uh, the overcurrent so um couple of ways to address this. The the first and most obvious one would be to use some different controllers that have a higher current limit. Um, there are some Ford controllers uh, that are also used on uh, Corvettes, I think, um, that have a higher current limit. And if I'd used those from the start, I don't think I would have run into this issue. Um, right now, I'm limited to about 60% PWM, which is which the fact that I'm able to run with a 60% PWM as hot of temperatures as I've been driving in and still able to keep the, temp the coolant temperature well under control tells me that the overall system works well. This is just a, a, a little glitch or, or issue. 
Um, other ways to do it would be to try to divorce the intercooler cooling circuit cooling air from the radiator cooling air. In other words, relocate the intercooler someplace so that the air is not going through the intercooler and then the radiator. Um, I'm probably just not going to bother with that. It, it would be a whole lot of work to do some, a whole lot of more extra work to do something like that. And since the performance is really quite acceptable, um, I, I'm, I'm probably just going to focus my efforts elsewhere. Um, one thing I seem to have discovered, though, is that my, my turbo seems to be overboosting. I think the wastegate's stuck, and so then that will, if you're running too much boost, then you have a really high pressure ratio, and that's going to increase the temperature of the air coming out of the turbo, which is going to exacerbate the problem. So there's a few little, few other things that I need to look at with it. But overall, um, does this work? Yes, it absolutely works. Would I recommend it for everybody? Nope. I think I've said that in other videos that this is not for everybody. I had a lot of supporting modifications I did. I divorced the transmission cooling from the engine cooling. Um, I added external oil coolers, and so that was good anyway because the, the factory oil cooler really wasn't as good as I thought it, as I wanted it to be. I, I saw as high as 235 or 240 degrees oil temperature, and now the highest I've seen is about 205, um, much happier with that. And then that also reduces a cooling load from the engine cooling circuit. Um, I had to put in bigger alternators to handle the electrical load of these fans because they do pull a lot of current. It, it, it was a big project, but um, overall I'm seeing about one to one and a half miles per gallon better uh, fuel economy going down the road, which when you're talking about something that gets under 10, that's huge. Um, will it ever pay me back? Uh, maybe if I drive it enough, but that mileage wasn't why I was doing this. Um, the, the biggest thing that I would say is a benefit is just how much quieter and how much smoother the engine runs. Um, you, you really noticed it before with the mechanical fan. It, it was, it was extremely noisy. Um, now, much quieter back behind the RV. Um, it, it's amazingly smoother and fan. Nobody really likes fan noise. So it's, it's getting, it's getting rid of a noise that you didn't want to have. So hope you found this interesting. Um, for those who sa said that it couldn't be done, I would say, yeah, it, it, it absolutely can be done. Um, I think I've proven that it can be done, but there is a lot of work that goes into it. And so you just have to decide for yourself, whether the effort that you're going to is worth the benefits. Um, I, I, for me, I would say it is. Um, it, it's the, the RV drives a lot better. I like getting the improved fuel economy. Um, pretty much everything I touched needed to get replaced anyway. And when you take a look at where I have the total cooling package now versus the stock, it, there's no doubt that I've improved the cooling system. Uh, versus what it was from the factory. When I first got this, the engine was running hotter than it was now, and keep in mind it had to produce more power to run at those temperatures because it was driving that big fan. My transmission runs a lot cooler, my oil runs a lot cooler, the engine coolant runs about the same. The lower numbers I gave before were after I'd done so, after I'd divorced the transmission cooling, which is a huge load by itself. And really, it's just, it's just much nicer. Even my wife really notices the difference and she never drives this. So hope you found this interesting. If you have any other questions or you're thinking about doing this on your bus, feel free to post them below and I'll answer what I can. Um, I'll, I've included some links in other videos to the parts that I used, so you can check those out. But hopefully you found this useful, and thanks for watching.